Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome again to the new lecture of this course, uh, Fundamentals and Applications of Dielectric Ceramics. So, let's just briefly, uh, let us let us just uh, recap the last lecture. So, so, in the last lecture, we were talking about domain formation and we said that, you know, the ferroelectric switching that occurs in the ferroelectrics. So, this is the hysteresis sort of you get and let us say this is P E and this ferroelectric hysteresis loop is because of domain formation and domain switching. So, initially when you switch a virgin ferroelectric, ferroelectric it switches linearly, then suddenly nonlinear region takes over and then again you go into linear region before you reach saturation. And this is basically in this region you have massive uh, domain uh, formation and then somewhere here at the end of it you have monodomain state and uh, when you come to this point after releasing so you you start in this fashion and then when you come to this point all the domains do not revert back so you have a state in which uh, so we'll we'll come back to that little later on but domains are nothing but regions of uh, uniform polarization orientation and they form because uh, because of competition between depolarizing energy energy which wants to depolarize the material to reduce the surface charge density and uh, interfacial energy which is nothing but domain wall energy right. So, as we saw suppose you have this as a dielectric if it is in mono domain state then you will have this kind of uh, situation where you have dipoles aligned in one direction. So, you have huge surface charge density suppose you create a domain which is 180 degree domain you create situation like this. So, you reduce the surface charge density and charges nullify each other. So, this, but at the same time you create a domain wall and this is single domain. Okay. So, this competition between the two energies leads to formation of domains and then domain, but they do not confuse domains with grains, grains are different, domains are different there is a possibility you can have multiple domains in one, one grain, there is also a scenario when multiple grains can be in single domain when you reach mono domain state. So, so, as a result you form a domain wall and this domain wall could be of the order of an unit cell thick or so, because what happens in domain wall formation is suppose you have this as a crystal. Okay. So, in this region your atoms are shifted up from the center of the unit cell. So, this is basically you can say polarization up. In this part of the crystal the atoms are shifted down. As a result in this part of crystal you have polarization vector shifting down and somewhere in between you will have a transition. So, you can see that you will have a transition going from here to here. So, this is where you will find atoms sitting somewhere in the middle and this would be nothing but this region would be the domain walls. So, depending upon the angle of misorientation of domains uh, you can have various kinds of domains. So, in tetragonal crystals generally we have we have 90 degree domains and 180 degree domains which means across the wall the, orient, the polarization changes by 
90 degree or 180 degree. Whereas, in for example, if you look at rhombohedral crystals, you may have uh, 71 degree domains, there is all I, I think also 109 degree domains and then another thing which I may not remember exactly, let me see. So, we have 180 degree domains, 71 degree domains and 109 degree domains and similarly, if you look for monoclinic crystal or you, you may have orthorhombic crystal or whatever else. So, it cannot obviously, cubic material will not have domains because cubic is centrosymmetric. So, as a result cubic will not show ferroelectricity. So, only crystals which are non-centrosymmetric which show ferroelectricity will have domain walls. So, etcetera, etcetera. So, these are all basically type of domain walls are, are crystal system dependent. Okay. So, this is what basically this uh, would be. Now, how the domains form in these crystals uh, we looked at that. What happens in a ferroelectric material is in a ferroelectric material generally what happens is that in case of practical capacitor, what will happen is that you will have a metal or you will have a ceramic. So, this is let us say your dielectric ceramic which is ferroelectric in nature. So, this is let us say ferroelectric and generally on the two sides of it you will put a electrode. So, these are electrodes, these are metal electrodes and when you apply electric field. Then what happens is that as a function of electric field slowly, we, we saw that the hysteresis uh, uh, curve is something like this, right. So, domains start nucleating right somewhere in the early phase. So, it, what happens is that the, the way domains start forming is domain start nucleating here at the interface between the electrode and the sample. And in between you may have domains of multiple orientation, but these domains grow. So, what might happen to begin with is let us say in the beginning you have a scenario in which all the domains are oriented in this direction. So, this is let us say a monodomain state all right. Once you have a monodomain state and you apply the electric field in another direction or let us say you go back to zero electric field what happens is that the reverse orientation domains they nucleate at certain locations. So, let us say they, they locate they, they form here these are nothing but domains of opposite orientation. So, you can call them as you reduce the field. So, this is a scenario the first scenario was this you will have monodomain state right. And then when you reduce the electric field, let us say you come here somewhere here, you have reduced the electric field, then what might happen is that you will have domains of opposite orientation nucleating. So, what will happen is that you will have domains of this orientation, this orientation, this orientation, these are all oppositely oriented domains. And as you keep reducing the field strength until you come at this point when you come to this point, then what will happen? These domains would have grown a little longer or bigger. Of course, they will not be of same size because it is a nucleation and growth phenomena. So, there will be some randomness associated with it, but they will be of certain size. And the polarization in all of them will be in this direction. So, you can see that you have no longer a monodomain state, but you have a net polarization, net polarization which is P plus let us say this is P plus and this would be P minus. 
which is difference between p plus and p minus. So, you will have delta p, this is nothing but your p r. This is what is the remnant polarization, this is because the not there is an unevenness in the volume of domains of each orientation. So, the, vo the, the, the volume of domains of earlier orientation is still larger as compared to volume of uh, new newly formed domains as a result you form what we call as uh, you have a PR and these and when you reduce the electric field further, when you reduce the electric field further what will happen is that these domains will grow further. Okay. until you reach this point where this point p plus will be equal to p minus as a result delta p will be equal to 0. So, this is where we will achieve at coercive field and then of course, when you go to this place back again and this place back again. So, in this case what will happen is that you will have a situation like this. So, you will reach a monodomain state, but in the opposite fashion. So, this is the electrode and a polarization vector will now be all along this. Okay. So, this will be again a monodomain. where p minus will be equal to p s minus p s okay. and at this place you had p plus which was equal to p s and the whole cycle goes on when you reduce to come here, you come there, you come there and this cycle repeats itself the, the mechanism of domain uh, growth and uh, formation. Okay. So, these domains are these domains can also be observed easily. So, domains domains can be observed can be observed using microscopy for example one can do optical microscopy one can do so you can if domains are big enough you can see them in optical microscope if they are uh, small then you can see them in transmission electron microscopy and they will when you look at the domains. Uh, so, let us say if this is a crystal you will see them as sort of lines or stripes and crystals. So, these are the regions which can show domains. So, you can form. So, these are stripes or you can say lines which can be uh, sort of uh, imagined as domains. So, I will show you one micrograph. So, this is the sort of a picture of uh, domains which have been uh, observed in a microscope. So, you can see that these are sort of regions in which you can see some stripes and there are some regions in between the stripes which are sort of the domains. So, this is a microscopy image which has been taken from ruitpoms.ac.uk. So, they have a library in which there are some images which show domain. So, if you go online look at this do it poms library at the University of Cambridge website you will see that uh, there are some of these uh, pictures which show how the domains can be observed. So, um, so these are uh, so this is about the formation of domains in these materials. Now, basically now it, it must be clear to you that uh, let us revisit the stereosis loop now. Okay. So, this is a polarization versus electric field hysteresis loop. So, if you start from a ferroelectric which has never been poled before and then you come to this point. So, you start formation of domains and then you go through a linear region then again you. So, this is initially in the linear region then you reach 
the end of uh, so you start at nonlinear region at, at B, then you finish the nonlinearity at C, then you again go into linear region until you saturate, and then depending upon the type of material, you can have very large difference between PS and PR and small different difference between PS and PR that entirely depends upon the system whether it is a polycrystalline material, whether it is a single crystal material, whether it is a thin film, thick film and so on and so forth. So, because in thin film there is a clamping effect as well as a result the clamping leads to um, uh, clamping leads to uh, different effects in thin films as compared to bulk. So, so at this point you can say that equal proportion of up and down domains. At this point you have mono domain state somewhere in between you will have um, let us say uh, you do not have mono domain state, but maybe domains of one type are more than domains of another type. At this point you have a situation like this where some domains come back, but not all the domains come back. So, there is an unequal distribution at this point again the proportion of uh, domains is such that so that the net polarization is 0. Then again at this point you reach the mono domain state again at this point you reach regions where you have opposite polarization larger as compared to the up polarization and then again you reach at this point where up and down are equal to each other. So, this is how domain switching is observed in ferroelectric materials and domains I reiterate again they form as a result of competition between the depolarization field or depolarization field driven energy which wants to depolarize depole the material and uh, the surface energy which is nothing but the domain wall energy. So, one is positive one is negative as a result you have a stable domain size for a given material. Now, let us look at the comparison of various ferroelectric materials in terms of their properties. So, the most important so what we have seen ferroelectric materials have characteristics such as one as Curie temperature which is called as transition temperature. Tc then another characteristic of them is saturation polarization Ps which is typically measured in micro coulomb per centimeter square this is in degree centigrade or Kelvin and then you have the electric constant at. Okay, and let us say what is it at T c okay. and when you compare various materials for example, something like Rochelle salt which is uh, N A K C 4 H 4 O 6 dot 4 H 2 O. This has a Curie temperature of about 24 degree centigrade. So, T c of 24 degree centigrade it has a spontaneous polarization um, of about 0 0.25 micro coulomb per centimeter square and it has a dielectric constant at T c of the order of 5000 okay, at T c. So, at T c we have anomaly in the dielectric constant it increases all of a sudden. Now, if you look at something like, uh, so this is of course, Rochelle salt which has a complex crystal structure. If you look at perovskite structured materials for example, let us say lead titanate. Lead titanate has a uh, T c of 490 degree centigrade very high T c. So, it remains ferroelectric up to very high temperature. It has a polarization as high as 750 micro coulomb per centimeter square it can have very large polarization although in polycrystals you do not see this kind of polarization, but nevertheless and uh, the dielectric constant is way too high it is sort of immeasurable. And then if you look at something like barium titanate, barium titanate has three transitions. The first transition as you cool down the material occurs at 120 degree centigrade. It has three ferroelectric transitions, it is ferroelectric in three different regions, but with different crystal structures. So, 125, 5 degree centigrade and 9, it is minus 90 degree centigrade and uh, it has a polarization of nearly 26 and electric constant again reaches to few thousand. 
okay. And then we have something like lead zirconate titanate. So, lead zirconate titanate is solid solution of lead zirconate followed by solid solution of PVZRTI O3. Now, lead, lead zirconate has a uh, so TC of 2, 230 degree centigrade and uh, it has a it is anti ferroelectric in nature. So, it is just like anti ferromagnet, it is anti ferroelectric and it also has a high electric constant. So, PVZRO3 is made by mixing. PVZRO3, PVZRTiO3 which is, which is commonly called as PZT, one of the best well known ferroelectric. It is mixed by uh, putting these two together PVTiO3, PVZRTiO3. So, obviously, it is TC depends upon the composition and it is TC is between 230 degree centigrade to 490 degree centigrade depending upon the ratio of of PT to PZ, PTO to PZO and uh, generally it is the composition of nearly 50-50, uh, 50 percent or to be precise it is uh, 57, 43 composition which is uh, the most uh, well known composition and this can have very large polarization. The thin films of this material show polarization of the order of you know 50 to 100 micro coulomb per centimeter square. This is also a fantastic piezoelectric depending upon how it is processed and how it is made it can show piezoelectric constants up to you know 1000 in fact even higher picocoulomb per newton. And uh, this is a benchmark material as we say in terms of performance PVZRO3. So, PB, PVZRTIO3 is you can say the most commonly used ferroelectric. Actually, it is its piezoelectric properties which are more exploited than its ferroelectric properties. So, it has very high piezoelectric coefficient and uh, maybe more than 1000 if uh, 1000 uh, picocoulomb per Newton or you can say you can you can calculate the direct piezoelectric coefficient depending upon so in, in indirect piezoelectric coefficient etc so it has it has very high piezoelectric coefficient and reasonably high tc tc is much above room temperature of course pt has 490 degrees centigrade so it's lower than 490 degrees centigrade but it has reasonably high tc depending upon the composition so this is one of the most used ferroelectric but the problem with pzt is that presence of lead and uh, current uh, environmental restrictions on the use of lead are making people to look for other alternatives. So, other alternatives, uh, no, alternatives are you know uh, lead free piezoelectrics as we call them. So, sodium based ferroelectrics, potassium based ferroelectrics, barium based ferroelectrics. So, these are all replacements for PZT to reduce the amount of uh, to, to eliminate lead or to reduce the amount of lead in them. Interestingly, PZT system shows it has a very interesting phase diagram and this phase diagram consists of what we call as a morphotropic phase boundary. And this morphotropic phase boundary exists at about uh, uh, let me see if I have the phase diagram with me. So, the morphotropic phase boundary is the boundary at which rhombohedral and tetragonal phases coexist. And this is at the MPV composition which is nearly 47 uh, 53 composition. So, at this phase boundary, uh, so uh, at this phase boundary you have a maxima in D33 uh, as well as uh, polarization and this is the most used uh, 
compound this is the most used uh, you can say uh, composition for piezoelectric. There are other alternatives as well because its transition temperature is little lower. So, things like BiFeO3 which is also a ferroelectric and its solution with PbTiO3 gives to much higher Tc and this also shows a MPB and this MPB is at 70 30 composition 70 percent BFO and uh, 30 percent dead titanate and this can also give rise to high uh, D33 maybe not as high as PZT, but significantly high, but much higher Tc because here bismuth ferrite has a Tc which is very high it is not 450 it is something like 800 or something degree centigrade I think it is about 870 degree centigrade whereas PT has a uh, Tc of 4, 490. So, if you mix them you have a Tc which is higher than 500 degree centigrade. So, it has much higher Tc, but D33 values are lower than PZT, but is still comparable. So, there are lot of other choices you can you have uh, uh, potassium niobate as a ferroelectric also you have as I said you have uh, lead free uh, piezoelectrics, lead free ferroelectrics you can say. You can have solid solution of BATIO3 with BIFeO3, which is again a lead free uh, ferroelectric, which again shows a MPB or morphotropic phase boundary. I will show you the phase diagram in the next class, but uh, um, we do not have time to go through the phase diagram in this class. So, and then you have other polymeric options such as uh, PVDF, uh, uh, which is nothing but CH2CF2N. Okay. So, PBDF again is a polymeric ferroelectric which has which does not have very high uh, piezoelectric coefficient of polarization, but it is still useful material because it is a polymeric you can make lot of flexible devices out of it. So, we will stop here, we will come back to some more uh, aspects of these uh, ferroelectric, piezoelectric and pyroelectric materials before we look into their applications. Thank you.